Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny podcast. With me, as usual, is Rob Hirschfeld. Uh, good day, Mr. Rob. Hello, Stephen. Hello, everyone. And uh, as usual, we always bring you great guests. And today, I have the unfortunate, um, I think that's the right word, because she went to Florida State, there's a bit of a problem here. <laughs> oh, we, 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 we are we are team alliance free. I am. Oh, uh, well, no, no. As, <laughs> as someone who went to Florida, this is difficult. But uh, we do have, of course, I'm, I like to tease Gina. Gina Rosenthal, who is a product marketing manager at VMware. Uh, welcome to the uh, podcast, Gina. Well, thank you, but I don't think I'm talking to you. Just to Rob, sorry. <laughs> uh, I am out. <laughs> you started it. I'm I did. By remote. We're all set. I did start. <laughs> so, so Gina, before we, uh, you know, start jumping into questions and stuff, can you just give us a quick uh, uh, background on your work and uh, what you're working on these days? Sure. Um, I'm a product marketing manager. I got here via community management, and before that, um, I. I, I, my master's is actually in education. I wrote and delivered and designed training for EMC um, and for their proven professional program. So I wrote the SAN classes. When they went on a software right, um, buying spree, I wrote all the software classes, at least the first version of them. Um, last thing I wrote was a network compliance software called Buoyance. Um, before that, I was a sysadmin. So um, what I'm working on now, I work for VMware, and because I've worked at Dell and EMC before, my job is I'm concentrated on making sure um, all the things we need to do with vSphere get done at Dell. Um, and so that's what I'm working on. It's, it's a pretty big range of things. Also, we just start, I just started a podcast with some former colleagues, and of course, I write um, for another blog and for myself, so always out and about. Um, asking questions and causing trouble. Uh, we should. So I, I'm interested to hear what your other podcast is. What's your What's uh, your topic going to be? Oh, so my other podcast is called Worldwide of Tech. Worldwide, yeah. World, what, uh, got it wrong. Wide World of Tech, um, okay. and I do that with James Honey and Kong Yang, um, and we worked at a, with, with each other at a couple of companies. They're both guys from Austin. And um, so the sports lead in is not that unfamiliar to me because we have always, you know, since we've known each other, have gotten very, these really deep conversations about, about tech, but not so much the, the nerd knobs, more about how do you keep sane and how do you drive a career even with all the politics and the craziness of tech. So we talk around that politics piece a lot. Um, and, and what you can do to survive it and, and things we see and what we think and you know how people are. Uh, we talk a lot about sports, though. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's, it's fun. So, it's just, it, so we're definitely not podcasters. We're not experienced like the two of you are. Um, so we're just trying. We're, we kind of just dived into it and dive into it. And we're trying to figure our way around it. But. <laughs> we're experienced <laughs> podcasters. I'm not sure I've ever heard that one. <laughs> yeah. I feel like. I feel like y'all are. Y'all are so smooth. It sounds so good. So, I like you are. Well, thank you. But maybe we'll make sure we get a link for your podcast okay. so people can check that out. I, I we love having collaborative uh, content for us. This is you know everybody's got some something interesting, and these conversations are are great. Um, yeah. And, and uh, you've you've been on on our radar for a while, but sort of came up very much out of a. Uh, uh, list of influencers, SREs, and operators that I put together for the end of the year. Um, and one of the things that we talked about in prep was sort of your sysadmin background and, and you know, being interested in the operational experience. What, what, direct, what brings you to operators? What brings you to that side of the, the IT house? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why I'm set there. I mean, my first job was in college. Um, it was an internship and I was, you know, responsible for three labs. And so that might be the first part of it. Um, and I was a sysadmin and I like it. I liked, um, I liked everything about being sysadmin except being on call, right? So I, I love just understanding how all of the information flows together and how you keep it going and how you make sure no one's trying to break in and, you know, how do you restore things if things are broken? How do you help the users out? How do you make sure everybody is able to get everything they're supposed to get? So that's my historical background with it. I mean, of course now vSphere is, is um, kind of 
the uh, you know it's leading hypervisor yeah. the hypervisors are the core of the cloud right you have to have that to to make a cloud work so oh, that's uh, fighting words but all right keep going we <laughs> no, we don't agree with that one anymore <laughs> we, well, we should we should fight about it because like we, you, maybe not having you you still have vms right uh. So uh, come on, let's just get into it. Let's, have to, let's take a step back and, and have you define what a cloud is for us. Uh, well, no, I mean, like, if, if, if uh, like the, the, okay, I see where you're going with it. I, I, so the fundamental, the fundamental building blocks of of anything, I think, modern architecture, are virtual, right? Oh, I I don't I don't necessarily agree with that. Actually, well, I'm, there's no necessary. Why not? <laughs> what do you disagree with? <laughs> I didn't mean to be controversial in the first two oh, seconds. I'm, I'm sorry. Controversial is awesome. No, no, it's much better. I don't want to feel like you walked into a trap. <laughs> so, so I virtual. I've been doing virtualization for a long time, um, and I, I think that when when I go back to my early early days of virtualization. The amazing thing was that I could write an API that made a server turn on or turn off or be created. And so there was an abstraction that we just didn't have for regular machines. Uh, and right. there, was a de there was density, there were some other benefits too. But the, mm -hmm. the, biggest, the biggest win was this API. And so when I think about cloud, I'm much more inclined to be talking about the APIs of the infrastructure, okay. not the virtualization side. So I totally get what you're saying there. So I guess I am way more operational than you realized, right? Okay. <laughs> because I, I would agree with you there. But I'd say that so at, those APIs have to land on something someplace. And there is somebody from an operational standpoint maintaining that. And that's kind of where I was going with it. Now, I don't think the end, end consumer of cloud services, right? They're definitely going to be architecting with policies and APIs and all the rest of it, but somebody is standing up that environment for them and keeping and, it going. And, and part of part of our I mean, so we do we do physical infrastructure automation, right? It's that's Rackham's mm -hmm. focus. It's where we live day to day. And one of the things when I look at like our OpenStack experience, the the OpenStack was all about bringing up virtual machines for people so they could have this API driven experience. Mm -hmm. And then we never fixed, it wasn't in the, the, the purview of OpenStack to fix the metal part, mm -hmm. which is where all the pain was, right? Um, and as we ramp things faster and faster, as we discover all sorts of hardware issues, now you got me on my soapbox. Um, <laughs> it, right, but if we don't fix the physical side of it, even if you put virtualization on top and give VMs out, um, I think that we keep, we're always vulnerable to, you know, actually the data center falling apart. Um, I, I agree with you. Um, so what makes <laughs> oper what, I'll, t I'll take that. By the way. Um, I do so agree what, with you. What, what makes ops so hard, right? It's the users. I'd say the devs make ops so hard. <laughs> That's not entirely true. I think, um, okay, so there's two ways to look at this. So we'll leave the cloud piece out of it completely. But if you look at just, just for now, you're, right? You're not, you're not going to bait me anymore on the cloud. Okay, good. <laughs> I wasn't dating you the first time. No, I know, I know. <laughs> so, so if you if you look at just stuff on premises, in a typical organization, even in a very small organization, if it's a if it's some place that's been around for a while and has had their own IT infrastructure for a couple of decades, there is no telling what you're going to find there, and there's no telling why it's still there. I know um, the last this had been job I had, we we um, I worked for a big pharma company. We were the technical arm of this big pharma company. And my division built um, websites for, for the doctors and patients to log into for clinical trials, to make clinical trials easier. And we had one, uh, and so the clinical trials, if you've ever had to work with that kind of regulation around it, at least in the US, usually the, the environment has to be around and accessible for, um, a certain amount of years plus the life of the patient. Um, and it's basically a big right. science experiment, right? So you can't change that hardware or software without a lot of paperwork once the trial starts. Um, we had one trial that was literally running on some old Dell 
desktop. Um, so we had everything in this colo in, in Lowell, Massachusetts. No, it wasn't even Lowell, someplace else, Bell Rica, I think. And like one of those places where you have to put your hand on to light it up and you're allowed to go in and you have to leave your cell phone at the front because it doesn't work anyway. And, and so like I would always, because I was low man on the totem pole, would always pull the holidays to have, you know, pager duty. <laughs> inevitably everything would blip from a power perspective everything would come back on and i would be able to get into all of the servers but i couldn't get into that stupid little um mm. rack top and that 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 desktop server and i think that one was like a cancer trial it was like a really important server couldn't go down so i'd have to drive an hour and a half oh. go through all the motions of getting in press a button and we couldn't move it. We could not move that server to a, a rack mount server that would have been more stable, probably more secure. Right. And I can't remember what the reasons were, but there was some kind of FDA, like big pain in the butt um, auditing thing that we couldn't do it around. But I think lots of organizations, to go back to the question, lots of organizations have stuff like that. They may have, um, uh, like I thought was interesting when we, some of these bugs that we've been going through, there's, there's companies that are running Windows 98 <laughs> for these are 2001 because they may have gotten a grant. Maybe it's not even a company, maybe it's a mm -hmm. state agency. They got a grant to run some software and it only works on 2001. And this company has since stopped making the software. There's no way to update it, downgrade it. And they have this legal mandate to keep running this particular software. So there's, there's all sorts of reasons that ops makes ops really, really hard. And I think that's why ops people are so ornery <laughs> because you know we know as we know service. that that's right owner is a service because we know what the problems are we also may yeah. know what the political reasons we can't do something that of course we'd rather have a script that we could write off the apis to run this and automate it and it would be one thing we didn't have to do that took 20 minutes out of our day every day but we can't because there's some political reason or some financial reason and we're just going to keep doing it the same old stupid way that makes no sense because of stupid reasons and the devs yell at us for it and it's not our fault it's how it has to be done well this is uh, heterogeneity <laughs> is is real and and hard right and and i it's you know in some of the communities that i that i get involved in you know we're doing quarterly or faster release cycles mm -hmm. um and then those releases are actually contingent upon a whole bunch of other stuff that have super fast release cycles and if i'm a developer I want latest, latest, latest. I don't want to be messing right. with you know two releases back or one release back. Um, right. And and it's so a you, you get into this, yeah. Oh, just roll a new patch. Just you know replace all my servers. You know because <laughs> you know I, I I gave you a patch that depended on you being in the new version, and I don't want to go back to the old versions and fix the patch all around. I mean even. I mean, for the stuff we're doing, oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! I'm, I'm excited and horrified at the same time. My team's doing biweekly releases. Yeah, that's um, fun. And it's super fast, right? So the features come out of that pipe very, very quickly. Um, but that but doesn't yeah. always mean that it's a great thing for the features to come out, right? So I know. Um, one of the last jobs I worked at, that was my deal with development, was like, you can't push it unless sales says it's okay. The reason why is because it was a SaaS offering, and literally sometimes if they push something and it changed the workflow, the devs might think, oh, it'll be great, this is easy, it's not that big of a change. But it would be a big deal to a salesperson who was in the middle of a demo that <laughs> didn't realize that the workflow changed and didn't know what to do. So my, my deal was you have to go talk to that sales leader. Make the, if that sales leader says, okay, this is not a big deal, everybody be cool with it, I'm cool with it. Otherwise, you know, that's part of what PMMs do is one of our big audiences is sales and making sure they're enabled. Like, you can't enable sales if you keep changing the way the workflow is and not telling them that's kind of mean. <laughs> <laughs> it's mean. <laughs> that's, well, it's, that's true. Although I've, I've been in sales situations where we get way too tied up in uh, the demo and not the value proposition. But um, won't argue there. <laughs> can't is, argue there. <laughs> it's you know as much as I love as much as I love the demos and 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 actually this this is you know if you're listening to this everybody loves a great demo, um, but sometimes we get very sucked into demo experience and uh, the you know we spend a lot of time on out of the box experience for self self service yeah. things like that but, and they're important. Um, but I, I don't I don't know about you we we find that. 
you know, even if you have a, a very complex offering with a lot of fe you know, feature capability, that, that first hour experience still matters, um, no matter how complex your, your downstream compl you know, system's gonna be or how much work it does. No, of course. And I think that it's a bigger thing with sales is just to be able to tell a good story, right? So if you can tell a story and you understand your customer's problem and you can tell a story about your product and that customer can see themselves in that story with your product solving their problem, that cinches everything. So telling a good story, highlight, maybe augmented by a good demo is great, but it's not the end all be all. That's, uh, I, like, I agree with you. Demos, especially if demos tell stories, then it's very helpful. Yeah. Um, just demos, gem, demos that throw out a whole bunch of, of features are, are not, as, not as compelling. I've been in, been in a couple of those. Um, but if, de if Dev changes the storyline every two weeks and doesn't tell you, that's kind of frustrating. <laughs> that's annoying. <laughs> that makes sense. What, what, about, what about the day two side of this, right? Because that's, you know, I can give you a great demo and show you a cool feature. It doesn't give you operational benefit necessarily. It doesn't show you. I, actually, let me step all the way back. How <laughs> do you demo day two functionality? I, I've been struggling on this one, right? It's operational import, operationally important, but nobody really cares. Hmm. So explain more what you mean by that question, because I have an idea, but so what, what so, are you really meaning? Uh, so if, if I want, and this, this comes back to a lot of the communities I'm, I'm, I've been involved in, a lot of the products that I see, spinning it up is one part of the experience, but it's really, and you get a lot of value, but it's maintaining it. We're talking about operators, maintaining that product and showing how the product is maintained or how you take a patch or how you deal with an upgrade or yeah. how you help somebody keep using the product, right? Keep it current. Um, Super think, important, right? But not, but very hard to show somebody why you do it or how, how that's valuable. I'd honestly say, and this is just my experience from being ops and maybe from my, I, I think that's why communities are so important, right? So it, you know, if you can look to a community where things are being answered and it's highlighted and, or they have, you know, people showing walkthroughs of just what you're talking about or what's the other, how else can I help? make my life easier with this product. Um, but I think that's one of the places where technical communities just really, really shine because you know, especially with the, like the products I'm working on right now, they, they have, they're kind of long in the tooth and they're very, very fundamental to, to data centers. And they're kind of, my, my, my product, everybody kind of forgets that it's important. <laughs> it doesn't really matters what the base of things are. That hypervisor Pfizer actually matters to upstream things. So yep. they forget like the other things that are important, like, I don't know, security around things or monitoring. Nobody cares about monitoring and nobody cares about backups. I mean, I sold backup products forever. <laughs> nobody cares that they're so important and the day two is so important. But um, I, I just think the communities is a great place because they, they you, users are great because they, they're the ones that have to take the products that vendors make and, and, um, make them real and make them work with not only their homegrown applications, but you know, other vendors products and they know our products better, I think, than we know them ourselves. So a really healthy user community helps with that a lot. That, I think, I, I think that that's a key insight, right? A lot of times the users and the operators will know the company's products better than the company knows them. Yeah. Generally the companies are on the, always on the new adding features, what the, you know, they're, they're selling new, they're not living with it the same way. Maybe the support exactly. people, but not the way the customers really do. Um, exactly. When, when you say community, right, I, I have this open source bent, you have a more vendor bent in your current role. Is there, you know, I, I watch op, open source communities really struggle with helping each other out. Um, we, go, yeah, go ahead. You really do? Because I mean, I've seen some open source communities that I mean, I think like OpenStack is a great one. I know that there's been like this big divide. And I don't follow it as closely as you, but yeah, I, I feel like there's, I feel like open source does a really great job at it. I feel like the vendor communities when, oh, this is going to get me in trouble. <laughs> I feel like if marketing gets too involved with it and, and they get in the way that it kind of shuts down some of the good stuff that can happen. But uh. if we, if, if, 
if we can get if we can stay out of the way and let the users and, and the technical resources internally just work with each other and talk to each other, they're really good. So that's it, it's interesting. I think of I think of like what VMware has as an, as an offering and any vendored product. Um, you can get a user can be very direct in giving you feedback. Uh, the vendor can be very specific in responding and has a very clear commercial motivation on how to respond, right? Can be very opinionated. When I look at the open stack, not open stack specifically, but open source more generally, you, you have a couple of weird dynamics that play out in those communities. One of them is vendors are not necessarily welcome. Yeah. <laughs> um, like you can't, you can't show up to the, the, the dev Slack, and I'm, I'm trying to run a, a Kubernetes um, operator SIG um, cluster ops and right we're, we're in this weird limbo because there's no vendor in that channel and there's even no installer in that channel we're trying to be installer neutral <laughs> and okay. so what what happens is that you show because we're trying to deal with operational issues mm -hmm. for Kubernetes but the first question that comes up is well how did you install it <laughs> oh, okay well what operating system are you using what right there's all these these architectural issues and by the time you're down in that sort of like, okay, now I have enough information to help you, you're, you're basically in the vendor's community or you're in the installer's community, which very often mm -hmm. is a vendor. Mm -hmm. um, and, and now, so you're, you're straight back into this, this vendor relationship, which then can be sort of feel weird if it's supposed to be open tools. But sense? what about it does but like then I have to turn around and ask because we go the other ways because there's lots of stuff that is part of vendors that's open source. I can't think of a really great specific advance it you know answer for that. But if uh, just look at any but well lots of people. Well, if, you're run open if, you're, stock, if you're interested right? in like um, the in the AI space uh, you have Google's whole platform which has a lot of open yep. source technology in it. Yep. And even with OpenStack, anything to do with storage, you know, or, or VMware even connected to OpenStack. So kind of goes the other way too. And then you go in to try to get answers and you do meet this, oh, you're a vendor. <laughs> what are you trying to do to me? Right. Kind of an attitude. So it kind of, you know, I never thought about this before. I know because from, you know, I've always been at one of the big vendors um, from a data center perspective, right? Sure. Um, and we've all, we all talk to each other kind of in back channels. And, you know, I, I think for the most part, reasonable pe people understand that, you know, we're all trying out, out there, we're all out there making a living, but we're kind of all doing the same thing. And we all know where each other plays and, and, and what everyone's strengths and weaknesses are. But there's been a desire for a long time. There's not really uh, a vendor neutral community. And, um, right. and it kind of almost seems like there needs to be a vendor neutral, open source, not open source, <laughs> just a technology community to help people with all of these, you know, questions or even just the getting started pieces. Yeah, and that's, I, this is one of my, my frustrations with um, where OpenStack, I think, should be headed, which is more of an open infrastructure community, um, because I think people need exactly what you described. Um, and then even OpenStack gets very tied into the code that that they wrote, yeah. they being you know the OpenStack, you know the, sort of the technical groups in OpenStack. Um, and then and then they end up saying, well, it's, it's OpenStack or get out get out of town, um, hmm. which which to me ends up not helping the operators. Right? We're talking about heterogeneity. Right? We have the, we used to have the chef puppet wars. Um, yeah. And, and a lot of companies I, we talked to were like, we have both. We don't want to fight. <laughs> we, we just want, we want help, not a fight. We don't want to be in a war. Um, and I think that's what we hear too, especially as you, if you see people, you know, trying to figure out what, are, what is a true hybrid um, environment. Um, companies, are, customers aren't going to one cloud provider. They're just not. They're not willing to put all of their data into one one bucket. I mean, and they shouldn't. And that sh it should be multi-source for everything. That's the smart thing to do if you can do it. And that you know, you, you get mergers, you get acquisitions, you get yeah. different technologies that are interesting. Um, TensorFlow is the Google thing I was trying to think of is an open tech that's mm -hmm. sort of tied to a vendor. Um, 
yeah, so you might choose Google for something because they have really good machine learning, and then you might decide to be you know, more on, on Amazon, or you might have a you know, Android Apple type market where you, you know, ah, this is the life that we live in, right? There, you aren't going to get yeah. away with any one, you know, approach or strategy in, in tech at this point. Um, and I don't think one is better than the other. I mean, I, 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 I think there are things to be said. I can't say that as a vendor. Of course, I think my is the best, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think that there, I think it's truly, a, a, it depends kind of scenario. And, and think about it. None of us really stay, we're not going to stay in one job, one IT job for 40 years. That's right. not going to happen. You're going to go from environment to environment and you're going to pick up new skills and you're going to have to be open-minded, you know, to take what you've learned, how you take what you've learned and apply it to something else. Because in every case, I guarantee you, you're able to do that. You, just because you learn one operating system doesn't mean that you can't learn another, right. you know, so I, one language, I, you, you can learn another. And that's, we, we have to approach it like that in some ways because the, the very nature of innovation is, right, you, you want to take, you were talking about, you know, VMware being sort of long, you know, been, it's been around for a lot, well, people expect it to be stable, it's very hard to mm -hmm. move the inertia of that product success into new areas, right? A lot of the innovation is going to come from things that don't have the maturity because they don't have the inertia. Um, but then it, but then it, it yeah. feeds over into, I mean, especially in our case, it feeds over into innovation because, you know, that's, if you're a well-established product, of course, you're like, oh, it's a new thing. We got to make sure that we're providing what our, you know, what our current customers and hopefully our future customers will want. So even that, even that feeds into innovation. I'd well, I, I think there's innovations that flow on top of stability. Um, and then there's innovations that come from being able to disrupt, you know, sort of say, all right, throw all that stuff away and just, and just roll. Right. Um, yeah, and then from, from our perspective, when we look at operators, and there's, there's really two classes, maybe I'm interested your take on this. So we see architects and SREs sort of in these early adopter camps, much more willing to, you know, try something new and make changes. We see operators as, you know, majority, you could even say late majority because they have to deal with, you know, what, what are the consequences of breaking something and being and, and, and carrying the pager and, and being being on call when, when somebody checks in code that has a weird dependency um, how do you how do you play that that balance right they both have to be satisfied I think it takes communication so at that same job um, it was the very first time I ever did what I would call looking back at it <laughs> DevOps and using my finger quotes um, because they pushed out a website that we knew it was coming, but they didn't tell us a lot about like the architecture or anything else. So we just figured it was going to work when they pushed it out. It would have broken all of the security things we set up. So they didn't understand our architecture. Mm. They wrote it a certain way. We wouldn't push it out. And I literally had a VP I had never met come and scream at me in my queue because <laughs> my boss wasn't in yet and they had a client waiting on it. And it, it, with, it, with FDA regulated stuff, that's a big deal, right? Is the security of things. And, and um, yeah, so, so that was the last time I didn't like make sure from the beginning, <laughs> like just tell me what's going on and I will make sure and I will write all of the documents I have to write to make sure the infrastructure is set up for you, for your website to be however you want it, but you've got to tell me earlier. So I think it's that communication piece. And I think it's, maybe it's just a, having, you know, like coming, Maybe it's like just coming to a realization that there's always going to be this tension, but it's healthy. If you don't have the developers pushing the boundaries and trying to do things and trying to do them faster and more in, in a more innovative way, you know, they're, they're the only ones that are going to do that for us. We need them to do it. On the other hand, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. And that's what the operators see because we are left with picking up the pieces if we, you know, somebody gets hacked or if the data is right. not backed up or something breaks, so. Or, well, or if you're supporting flavor of the day, you might end up supporting flavor of the day for a lot longer than anybody realizes. <laughs> like, oh, what's this weird, you know, operating system? Oh, you know, oh, look, we still have OS2 in our data set. Oh, That's why, yeah. Um, and so you, you know, you have to be super careful from that perspective. I, the, so on DevOps, you know, 
I, I hear people talk about DevOps being dead, it, it's, which is the IT catchphrase of the right of the year, of course. <laughs> um, but I, I do think DevOps has been changing in the last five years, and it's very different today than it was five years ago. Is, is that, do you, do, you, do you share that experience? And if so, what do you think that the transformation is? So I'd be curious to see what you think the change is. I will tell you that what I hear from customers, it shocks me sometimes, like how I think ops are way more advanced in doing things than, than, to, than, than they get credit for. Like, I, I think that, I think that they've, I think a lot of companies have figured out how to, to um, offer services and offer a service, a true service catalog. And they figured out in the back end how to do this stuff. Like, I think that that was our disagreement about cloud in the beginning. There's somebody on the back end supporting that physical hypervisor to hypervisor layer um, infrastructure, but it's all obfuscated to make things super, super easy for, um, for the developers. And so for me, I'm kind of shocked how many companies are doing that already. So this is an interesting uh, thing because the companies that we're dealing with are typically not big VMware customers. We're, we're dealing with people who are really trying to implement an open source strategy and trying to, to move away from proprietary technology. Mm -hmm. um, and they do it for a variety of reasons. Cost is one of them, but not always. Hold on just a moment. And in, in that transition, they're looking for, you know, big commodity infrastructures or they're, they're really trying, you know, they're, they're reinventing it. But I'll tell you, it, it, you know, I think VMware customers have a benefit in that they're leveraging this big proprietary stack of technology that does what you're describing. Mm -hmm. What they don't do um, is a, a, lot of, a lot of the people we talk to, they've, they've ridden that wave. Um, and, and in some ways, I've described uh, VMware and ESX as being the worst thing that happened in data centers. Oh, what? Yeah, I'll, I'll explain. <laughs> hey, I was part of this wave. Um, and here's why. Here's why. I, VMware showed up with so much great technology, with so much capability, especially once the vMotion pieces showed up. And, yeah, and yeah. You know, that we turned around and said, hey, I'm an operator. I can give you machines that never fail, that don't, you know, and we turned out from having to deal with real operational discipline and patching and things like that into systems where we, we sort of took an operational pass on things that I think we, we should have fixed. We allowed a technical debt to accumulate um, and people forgot what, it, what, what that meant, what, what keeping up with, with your operating systems and patches and not relying on servers that never fail look like. Um, and I think you know that the 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 cardio the cardiovascular workout you need, not from a watching things fail, but just from a, just being in good health. I think we let slip um, from an enter, enterprise perspective more than we should have. Hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> I'm not um, sure I agree. I'm not sure I agree with that. I think in some organizations I would agree with it. I'm not sure if I totally agree with it because I think there's also. This automated piece of it that I don't think I don't think everybody's up to speed with yet. You know, once you turn operating systems into code, you turn servers into code. There's all sorts of stuff you can do to automate. And that's where I get excited about where where things are going. Um, but, but I've watched people just not not invest in that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, right, we're, we're, we're having a lot of fun talking about immutability and immutable infrastructure. We can, we can go there in a second, but you have, you, you, you would challenge me to give you my, my side of the DevOps piece. And I'll, yes. I'll do that. Um, so I, I really think we've transitioned the conversation from configuration management, chef and puppet, right? and Ansible and Salt and things like that. And, and how do I automate the configuration of a system and then the day two operations towards much more pipelined conversation? So how do I integrate a dev to deploy process? And, and I think that that's actually a much healthier conversation because it, it requires the communication between all parties where configuration management ended up being a, the sort of, and I'm sighing in, in the, as a proxy for the 
the relationship. The relationship was sort of like, hey, I, I expect you to do a configuration build for me. And yeah, then you the wall. Sort of like, and then you're, and you're like, sorry, are you just, you keep breaking it. I'll do it, <laughs> fine. Um, and then so the operators sort of tried to give up this control. They got automation, but they never created the integrated business process that I think we're starting to have with CICD pipelines. Um, no, so that, that's, that's, that's that is my, exciting I, too. It's a big deal. Um, and I think yeah. there's all sorts of interesting benefits. But I, that's how I see de the DevOps conversations have changed in the last five years to me around that. Um, it it does I, sometimes I think, operators out though. I, I think maybe that I've seen the end results of that because I can't see, and this is not just VMware customers, right? Because I actually go to open source meetups and I always ask the ops question and then I get the evil eye, but it's funny. So I do it anyways. <laughs> but I, I would say that I don't think that you can get to this point where you are able to offer um, that infrastructure as a service to your dev so that they don't see all the behind the scene things without having a really good relationship with your development team. There's just, because you don't know what's coming and you don't know what to give them and you don't know what they need. So I, ca I can't see that happening without the, that conversation going on and that relationship happening. Makes a lot of sense. Well, and, and if you're not careful, you could be end up just supporting stuff that you didn't even realize they were going to do. <laughs> uh, which you're going to do yeah. anyway, but there's degrees. <laughs> there's definitely degrees. Um, I I like that you at least feel for the operators. That, that operation <laughs> that we, makes me we, feel welcome. <laughs> we, we, we love op, we love the operational side of this um, very very much. Um, and I and when I look at the open source tech, it's very hard to get the you know an open source community to sort of think through the operational challenges. Um, in part because I think the vendors want to want want that relationship. Um, in part because it's just not as it's not as exciting. I think it's the I think it's the latter, right? Who wants to do this boring job? You know, who wants to think about backups and security and, and like that's not the fun part of tech. Let's, let's be honest. I think it is because I like it because I'm weird. <laughs> but but like most people is like you want to invent something new and you want to you don't want to have to think about how do you keep this up and running flawlessly without anything going down and if it does you have something automatically to you know to mitigate it so gina if we keep abstracting everything away as a developer i don't have to worry about anything isn't that the problem no i think it's the opposite you don't have to worry about you don't have to worry about building a machine you just have to worry about writing awesome code and making really cool stuff. But someone has to deliver that machine. Right. That's why you have to have a, you have to have a good relationship with your ops people. So, yeah. it, so it, what you need is, so, so that area that you need to, to work in is just there. And, and, and what's the key to that, making that relationship happen? Is there Commu communication? Com yeah, but <laughs> that's what else? I mean, I, 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 I guess we seem to find that it's difficult because the developers don't want to talk to operators and the operators are mad at the developers and then it all kind of just blows up. Do you think it's better than we realize that there is more communication or do you think it's as bad as we think? I, but you guys are in the, in the, you guys are in the thick of it. So I would tend to rely on you and, and knowing, I don't know. Do you think there's like different personality types that go, go take one path or the other? Maybe that's something with it too. Maybe there's some kind of, you know, like um, psychology you guys could apply to it to figure it out. Maybe there's just some of us are meant to be devs and some of us are meant to be ops and we're never going to get along really at a fundamental I, level. I do, I do think that there are some, uh, there are definitely psychology uh, personality types that are, that are suited, you know, sort of gravitate one way or another. Um, just, just the way you described ops when you, you were starting, right? It was much more collaborative, you know, looking to help, trying to figure out the problems people were solving. Um, well, right? I don't, well, I don't know if that's how I describe all ops. I think ops are ordinary as they can be. And I've worked sure. with ops that are, you know, I, I think I learned to love this in spite of the people I worked with in the beginning. So I think it was more, I was just stubborn. I was like, I can do it. Stop telling me I can't.
I, kind of. I, I, you know, I, we, we like to joke about ops being ornery on, on our team too. And sort of the, you know, this is the way things are going to fail and, and, you know, mm -hmm. you have to say no because things are going to, um, and I, I do think there, there is a certain degree of that without a doubt, but at, at the same time, uh, you know, operators do actually like to help people, right? You're, you're not, you're not in it, you know, protect, sort of protecting your system at all costs. It's, you know, you, you know that people need to use it. You, you get, you know, you don't want to be sustaining a, a operational environment of one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you want to make people like, happy. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I, I think that's a, that's a part of it. And part of the dev pipeline, I think is a better, you know, we're more in communication, we're more automated. And I, I do also know, uh, you know, the operators we, we talk to get very excited to watch you push a button, the gears turn and, and, you know, something, something great happens on the other side, these highly automated, maybe Stephen, this is where you were going. Um, these highly automated chains where stuff happens by itself or the, yeah. you know, the, 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 the car stays on the road all by itself. Mm -hmm. um, those are, those are exciting. It is. I mean, even, nobody that's a really good sysadmin and that's part of what you do on a daily basis. I learned to script because the first job I had had like, individual tape um, cartridges things that you would press the tapes into and then from from Solaris I had to type the command line for like eight it was like eight or twelve individual ones every single day I begged to go to a pro to a scripting class this is Solaris yeah. scripting class so I could write a script that would like start everything off I could push all the tapes in had to do that manually then I could have the script that would kick off the backups Nobody as a sysadmin doesn't do that. You're constantly trying to figure out how do I, how do I automate things? That's why Kickstart ex exists and then Jumpstart exists. And, you know, that's why all of this exists so you can automate things. So I think sysadmin, uh, this would be a great time to be a sysadmin because there's so much you can do with automation. There's really cool things you can do. Um, like I would have died for some of these tools that are available now that weren't available back in the day. So I think that's part, just part of who a sysadmin is. I think that, I don't know how to make the communication work, but the communication has to happen between the two sides to figure out, okay, so what are the, what do you want your, what is this? If I automate everything down to nothing, what am I automating? If I'm, I'm automating it for you. So what is it supposed to look like? So you can do your job, which is building the product that our company depends on. Right. And I, I would actually say when I think about site reliabilities and SRE and where SRE has been going, is I actually want you to be able to get logs and status yeah. and things like that back, right? I'm actually, it's not just, yes. hey, I deployed it for you. It's, hey, I, you know, I'm monitoring it. And I, I have, I've built all this extra infrastructure and I can tell you when your performance is degrading and I can tell you when systems are down and I can add a chaos monkey and we can troubleshoot yeah. this together. Um, yeah. And I guess, you know, when you frame it like that, where, where I think about the big change from, you know, if we go way back in, in ops to today, is the, the time latency between a developer action and an operator response gets shorter yeah. and shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, and, you know, you keep bringing it back to communication. If, if a developer takes an action in seconds later, an operator sees that action, then the communication loop is easy or easier. You know, 10 years yeah. ago, it took weeks, yeah. <laughs> months for an operator, for a developer action to show up on an operator's radar. Um, well, we, or maybe you would see it, but you didn't realize it was because a developer did it, right? right? So if a developer makes a change and then all of a sudden you start seeing this, you know, weird behavior or, or something erroring out. And there maybe they didn't build into it really good error codes or any kind of feedback so you could know what it was. Those teams weren't talking to each other. So by the time the sysadmin, the administrator kind of went down and figured out, oh, it must be from that day. I remember I saw an email that they were going to do this. You know, when, when like what you just said, that if, they, if they're talking to each other and that communication is there, they're helping each other understand, if you do this for me, I can make it do this. And I think that's, that's pretty cool too. Yeah, I, I think you're hitting the nail on the head, right? That's a, a really big deal um, from pulling all that together. It's, it's a really interesting insight. 
See, I think Steve doesn't get it because Stephen doesn't get it because he <laughs> get past the fact. it's all going to come back to football, right? He can't even get it past the fact that I went to FSU. So let's no, just, that, just, that, just, that's <laughs> just uh, you know. At least you're not. At least you didn't go to Michigan. Then it would be completely. <laughs> oh wait, my boss did, and he might listen to this, so I have to. Don't well, like, that's that's his loss. <laughs> you have to be careful where you throw where you where you throw shade. We have a Ohio State hasn't lost in so many years. I'm okay with that. <laughs> but see, but this is the thing. I mean, we're trained from uh, societally, right? Like, I'm this camp, I'm that camp, I'm this team, I'm that team. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that that like how like we're breaking down the walls here. We're talking to each other now. <laughs> but like that's kind of what we need is we need to realize, you know, that what we're doing is just because I'm an ops person and you're a dev person, we are doing the same thing. We're we're on the same. We're on the same overall team. We have to work together to figure it out and figure out where that tension is because where that tension is, if you can, it's like with communication, it's just communication 101, <laughs> wherever that tension is, if you can work around that, there's, that's where the innovation lies, honestly, right? Well, and, and I think what, what you're identifying here is something that we can take back when we think about vendor or open source community conversations around this. If we can find ways to shorten that loop, then, then that becomes a better communication cycle. Um, and it's a little bit scary to me because I'm thinking about, all right, so if I'm a vendor and I'm releasing, this is why we move to biweekly releases. We, were, you know, we don't expect everybody to take every release, but the feedback mechanism we get as we go through that cycle um, lets us have much tighter communications with the users and the operators, right? So our, our, our time loop is much faster. Um, which is really what we're trying to drive from that perspective. It's different um, mm-hmm. than it used to be. Uh, but in open source communities, right, you get into the same thing. It's like, well, I took the last release and now I'm having an issue. Um, and it's much harder to keep, to keep that sort of tightly coupled communication model. So does that mean that we're going to move into a place where everybody using software had better be prepared to be much more aggressive mm-hmm. about taking patches and, and cycles and moving through it moving through i don't i don't think so i don't know but i would say i don't think so i think what it does mean is um it's really important to have people on on both sides of your team that understand the operational piece because when you think about operational piece it's not just the patches from one software patches from one software can potentially impact every other piece of software you have installed I mean, just right. take for ex- take the chip stuff that we're dealing with right now, right? Spectre meltdown. Right? right. Think about that and how how that. And I would hate to be a sysadmin right now. I honestly would. That impacts every single thing. On top of if you're on an organization where you're iterating every two weeks, that's a lot. That's a lot because then you have so many moving parts. You're trying to work on my operating system, your virtualization, if you have that. Your database is software. If you have what all the software in your environment plus your own software that relies on all of that is moving so fast. So, I think what we have, what you have to have, is people who really, really um, are are very well versed in their own environments and they understand the intricacies of things and they can communicate to other parts of the business about why we're not applying these patches or why we have to apply these patches and why everything seems like it's broken all the time. I think. The communication comes up again, right? It does, and and the everything is broken all the time is sort of the <laughs> feeling we get as we try to maintain even some the most basic um, operating system deployments, right? One thing changes and the whole tower falls apart. Um, That's what happens because one thing changes if you, especially in something so core, one thing changes, it can have so many implications. You know that maybe something changed that the developers of that particular software didn't didn't think was a big deal, so they went ahead and pushed it, and and maybe they did some kind of product development, you know, business case where it's not going to impact 85% of my customers. But if you're in the 15% of the customers that it impacts, and you have to figure out the workaround and explain that, and it's it, it it's a lot of work keeping up with all the dependencies and then communicating with everybody about what's going on. Right. Which is where an automated pipeline or continuous, continuous integration tests help with that cycle, right? Fail fast, fail often. Mm-hmm. Um, and documented, you have it documented too. So that's like a, 
a great thing with that continuous piece. Hopefully it's all documented automatically. <laughs> A, a lot. We have a lot to think about. I, I have more <laughs> topics that I would bring in, but I know we are out of time. Out of time. Uh, uh, dear. I have so it's so much like immutable. I want oh, well, another control time. Rob. Because <laughs> control. Our, I'm holding back. Podcast. I'm holding back. Just you know, we could be two, three hours. They become novel. Po I don't know what's a podcast that's super long. It's not quite a novel. There needs to be some a mini series. Uh, a mini series, maybe that's a, a novella. A novella. <laughs> <laughs> it needs a new you word. A bad guy. <laughs> it's bigger than the pod. It's a. It's a. Uh, I don't know. Bad cast. I don't know. I don't know. Well, Gina, I I'm gonna step in now and thank <laughs> you for for the listeners, Gina, that want to um, get more information about you. Maybe read your blogs and again this new podcast. Can you let us know and and then the blog I post around this. I'll also make sure to add that information. Oh uh, yeah, of course. For sure. Um, so Wide World of Tech is our new podcast. It's on Twitter, too. Um, as my best place to find me is G Minx on Twitter. And I also write for 24 by 7 IT Connection. Um, that's a great blog as well. Especially that, and it's very, very operator focused. So I don't know. Maybe, maybe this could be like the part of the bridge that we start building to bring everybody together. It'll be like Florida and Florida State holding hands. Well, let's not give that example because I don't know about that. <laughs> Well, Gina and Rob, thanks again uh, for joining us today. Uh, to our listeners, I hope you uh, enjoyed this week's podcast. And as usual, if you have ideas for future uh, topics or people you'd like us to talk to, please reach out to Rob or myself, and we will make sure to add those uh, contacts. Thanks again, Gina, for talking with us. Uh, thanks for having me. This was great. Gina, it was a blast. Thanks.